family, friends, career, educational goals, plans for time outside of work, uh, attention to your mental and physical health, etc. Like, you don't need to have all these things, but you better have most of them. That's what life is about. And if you don't have any of those things, well, then all you've got left is misery and suffering. So that's, that's, a, bad, that's a bad deal for you. But once you set up that goal structure, let's say, and that's really, in many, in many ways, that's what you should be doing at university. Is, is, that's exactly what you should be doing, is trying to figure out who it is that you're trying to be, right? And you, you aim at that. And then you use everything you learn as a means of building that person that you want to be. And, and I really mean want to be. I don't mean should be, even those things, those things are going to overlap. Specify your damn goals. Because how are you going to hit something if you don't know what it is? That isn't going to happen. And often people won't specify their goals too because they don't like to specify conditions for failure. So if you keep yourself all vague and foggy, which is real easy because that's just a matter of not doing as well, then you don't know when you fail. And people might say, well, I really don't want to know when I fail because that's painful. So I'll, I'll keep myself blind about when I fail. That's fine, except you'll fail all the time then. You just won't know it until you've failed so badly that you're done. And that can easily happen by the time you're 40. I would recommend that you don't let that happen. So that's willful blindness, right? You could have known, but you chose not to. Apparently, millennials are tough to manage. And they're accused of being entitled and narcissistic, self-interested, unfocused. But entitled is the big one. And because they confound leadership so much, leaders are asking the millennials, what do you want? And millennials are saying, we want to work in a place with purpose. Love that. Um, we want to make an impact, you know, whatever that means. And yet, for some reason, they're still not happy. And that's because there's a missing piece. I can break it down into four pieces, four characteristics. One is parenting, the other one is uh, technology, the third is impatience, and the fourth is environment. The generation that we call the millennials, too many of them grew up subject to failed parenting strategies, where, for example, they were told that they were special all the time, they were told that they could have anything they want in life, just because they want it. Okay, so once you get your goal structure set up, you think, okay, if I could have this life, looks like that might be worth living, despite the fact that it's going to be, you know, anxiety-provoking and threatening, and there's going to be some suffering and loss involved and all of that, obviously. The goal is to, to have a vision for your life such that, all things considered, that justifies your effort. At some point, we all bought into this lie that you've got to feel ready in order to change. We bought into this, this complete falsehood that at some point you're going to have the courage, at some point you're going to have the confidence, and it, it's, it's complete garbage. And so there are so many people in the world, and, and, and you, know, you may be watching this right now, and you have these incredible ideas, and what you think is missing is motivation. And that's not true. Because the way that our minds are wired, we are not designed to do things that are uncomfortable or scary or difficult. Our brains are designed to protect us from those things because our brains are trying to keep us alive. We all do it. We do it subconsciously. We're wired that way. We're actually looking for threats. Our ancestors, many years ago, weren't just looking for the saber-toothed tigers. They were worried about who they encountered and whether they would be friend or foe. Joseph Ledoux from New York University says that there's no evidence that our brains are hardwired for fear. What he does say is that we have the circuitry that allows us to detect and respond in pre-programmed ways that's modifiable. The benefit of that is when you get a bad email, you don't have the same reaction as if you saw a saber-toothed tiger. And in order to change, in order to build a business, in order to be the best parent, the best spouse, to do all those things that you know you want to do with your life, with your work, with your dreams, you're going to have to do things that are difficult, uncertain, or scary, which sets up this problem for all of us. You're never going to feel like it. Motivation's garbage. You, you only feel motivated to do the things that are easy. Why is it so hard to do the little things that would improve my life? What I've come to realize is that the way that our minds are designed is our minds are designed to stop you at all costs from doing anything that might 
hurt you. And the way that this all happens is it all starts with something super subtle that none of us ever catch. And that is with this habit that all of us have that nobody's talking about. We all have a habit of hesitating. Mm. We have an idea, you're sitting in a meeting, you have this incredible idea, and instead of just, you know, saying it, you stop and you hesitate. Now what none of us realize is that when you hesitate, just that moment, that micro moment, that small hesitation, it sends a stress signal to your brain. It wakes your brain up and your brain all of a sudden goes, oh, oh wait a minute, wait, wait. Why is he hesitating? He didn't hesitate when he put on his killer spiky sneakers. He didn't hesitate with the uh, really cool track pants. He didn't hesitate with the NASA t-shirt. Now he's hesitating to talk, something must be up. So then your brain goes to work to protect you. Then what do you do? And you turn down to the micro routines. It's like, okay, well, this is what I'm aiming for. How does that instantiate itself day to day, week to week, month to month? And that's where something like a schedule can be unbelievably useful. Google Calendar. It's like, make a damn schedule and stick to it. That's the first thing that people do wrong. They say, well, I don't like to have, follow a schedule. Well, it's like, well, what kind of schedule are you setting up? Well, I, sh I have to do this, then I have to do this, then I have to do this, you know, and then I just go play video games because who wants to do all these things that I have to do? It's like, wrong. Set the damn schedule up so that you have the day you want. That's the trick. It's like, okay, I've got tomorrow. If I was going to set it up so it was the best possible day I could have, practically speaking, what would it look like? Well, then you schedule that, and obviously there's a bit of responsibility that's going to go along with that, because if you have any sense, one of the things that you're going to insist upon is that at the end of the day, you're not in worse shape than at the beginning of the day, right? Because that's a stupid day. I was shocked when I met a one-legged taxi driver in Kenya, and I was shocked when I met a disabled subsistence farmer in Mozambique. What shocked me wasn't their poverty, but their happiness. I found their happiness confronting, far more confronting than poverty. Of course, not everyone was happy, uh, but of those above a basic subsistence threshold level, I was surprised at how genuinely content many of them were. And since then, I've researched it, I've worked on it, I've thought about it. I'm interested in it from an economics perspective. It's one of the things that I research at Oxford, because happiness is, after all, the ultimate social outcome. And I think it's particularly appropriate that we talk about happiness today because we have with us uh, the Prime Minister of Bhutan, the very man who introduced and who championed the idea of gross domestic happiness uh, rather than GDP as a way uh, of tracking countries' progress. We're wealthier than ever, but unhappier than ever. We're more prosperous, but more depressed. We're less satisfied. I mean, we have faster and faster transport, but we're faster and faster to complain about it. In many countries, there are now more suicides than homicides. Uh, we now have more goods and services than ever before. We have technology improving exponentially, but we don't see a corresponding increase in our life satisfaction, in our happiness. It's perhaps one of the great paradoxes of our time. And I think the obvious question is, why is it that governments and individuals are such bad predictors of happiness? Why is it that we get it wrong so often? And I think it's because we don't really understand why it is that we're often unhappy. I think there's one explanation that I find far more compelling, far more plausible, far more persuasive than any other. And that explanation isn't that we have so much choice that we get stressed. It's not that we're economically worse off. In many cases, we're economically better off. It's not that we just have greater reporting of depression and suicide. That's true, but it only explains a small portion of the data. It's not due to family breakdowns or reduced freedoms. No, the reason why we're unhappy, the most compelling reason, as shown by the data, as shown by research, relates to expectations. At a very basic, simple level, we're unhappy when our expectations of reality exceed our experiences of reality. It's a very simple concept, but it's a hugely important concept to fully understand, to fully get our head around. And to help us get our head around it, I like to think in terms of three different types of expectation gaps. Three different types of gaps based on the different ways in which we form expectations. You see, when we choose to buy goods, we choose from a range of options. How do we make that decision? What we do is that we choose the one that we think will be the best. Now, the problem here is that the very act of choosing the thing that we think will give us the greatest happiness is the thing that actually undermines our happiness. Because what it means is that we, when we then see reality, when we then experience it, it's highly likely that that reality 
won't live up to our expectation. And that leads to disappointment. You have to negotiate with yourself and not tyrannize yourself. Like you're negotiating with someone that you care for, that you would like to be productive and have a good life. And, and that's how you make the schedule. It's like, and then you look at the day and you think, well, if I had that day, that'd be good. Great. You know, and you, you're useless and horrible, so you'll probably only hit it with about 70% accuracy, but that beats the hell out of zero. Right? And if you hit it even with 50% accuracy, another rule is, well, aim for 51% the next week, or 50.5% for God's sake, or because you're, you're going to hit that position where things start to loop back positively and spiral you upward. So that's one way that you can work on your conscientiousness, is plan a life you'd like to have. You have to understand that you're not your own servant, so to speak. You're someone that you have to negotiate with. And you, you're someone that you want to present the opportunity of having a good life to. You know, if you take people, and I've told you this, and you expose them voluntarily to things that they are avoiding and are afraid of, you know, that they know they need to overcome in order to meet their goals, their self-defined goals. If you can teach people to stand up in the face of the things they're afraid of, they get stronger. And you don't know what the upper limits to that are, because you might ask yourself, like, if for 10 years, if you didn't avoid doing what you knew you needed to do, by your own definitions, right, within the value structure that you've created, to the degree that you've done that, what would you be like? Well, you know, there are remarkable people who come into the world from time to time, and there are people who do find out over decades-long periods what they could be like if they were who they were, if they said if they spoke their being forward and they get stronger and stronger and stronger and we don't know the limits to that we do not know the limits to that and so you could say well in part perhaps the reason that you're suffering unbearably can be left at your feet because you're not everything you could be and you know it and of course that's a terrible thing to admit and it's a terrible thing to consider but there's real promise in it right because it means that Perhaps there's another way that you could look at the world and a number, another way that you could act in the world so what it would reflect back to you would be much better than what it reflects back to you now. Imagine that many people did that because we've done a lot as human beings. We've done a lot of remarkable things. Today, for example, about 250,000 people will be lifted out of abject poverty and about 300,000 people attached to the electrical power grid. We're lifting people out of poverty collectively at a faster rate that's ever occurred in the history of humankind by a huge margin, and that's been going on unbelievably quickly since the year 2000. So there's inequality developing in many places, and you hear lots of political agitation about that, but overall, the tide is lifting everyone up, and that's a great thing, and we have no idea how fast we could multiply that if people got their act together and really aimed at it. What would happen if you just stopped wasting the opportunities that are in front of you? You'd be, who knows how much more efficient, 10 times more efficient. 20 times more efficient. That's the Pareto distribution. You have no idea how efficient, efficient people get. It's off the charts. Well, and if we all got our act together collectively, and stop making things worse, because that's another thing people do all the time, not only do they not do what they should to make things better, they actively attempt to make things worse because they're spiteful or resentful, or all of those things all bundled together in an absolutely pathological package. If people stopped really, really trying just to make things worse, we have no idea how much better they would get just because of that. You see, it isn't merely that your fate depends on whether or not you get your act together and to what degree you decide that you're going to live out your own genuine being. It isn't only your fate. It's the fate of everyone that you're networked with. And so, you know, you think, well, there's seven billion people in the world, and who are you? You're just one little dust moat among that seven billion, and so it really doesn't matter what you do or don't do, but that's simply not the case. It's the wrong model, because you're at the center of a network. You're a node in a network. You'll know a thousand people, at least over the course of your life, and they'll know a thousand people each, and that puts you one person away from a million, and two persons away from a billion. And the things you do, they're like dropping a stone in a pond. The ripples move outward, and they affect things in ways that you can't fully comprehend, and it means that the things that you do and that you don't do are far more important than you think. Well, of course, the terror of realizing that is that it actually starts to matter what you do, and you might say, well, that's better than living a meaningless existence. I can live with no responsibility whatsoever. The price I pay is that nothing matters. 
or I can reverse it and everything matters But I have to take the responsibility that's associated with that It's not so obvious to me that people would take the meaningful path if you live a pathological life you pathologize your society and if enough people do that then it's hell Really and you can read the Gulag Archipelago if you have the fortitude to do that And you'll see exactly what hell is like And then you can decide if that's a place you'd like to visit And take all your family and friends Because that's what happened in the 20th, 20th century, century.